in, unfortunately the day and age that we live in uh, necessitates a very high level of security and I know that a lot of people here were called by Ben just to verify it's nothing personal we just have to take these extra steps so I apologize for that in advance and I appreciate everybody arriving here early um, also the charge for the event is ten dollars it's to cover the food and beverage we're a not-for-profit organization and we appreciate any donation uh, which makes these events possible we are extremely excited to have Eugene Kondorovich back he is one of our favorite speakers, not just because he's so well versed in international law, but he also happens to be really funny. Um, he is a professor of law at Northwestern. He's also a fellow at the Lawfare Project. And he's going to be talking about, or actually, I guess, uh, destroying one of the main arguments of the BDS movement, which is that international law forbids doing any type of business with um, countries engaged in occupation and I just want to make clear uh, when we sent this invitation out a lot of people wrote back to us oh you mean disputed territories and in fact we said no what we're not describing Israel as engaging in any type of belligerent occupation in fact what we're trying to do here is refute the argument as, as we say in the description of the BDS movement that even if there was an occupation it still would be legal to engage in commercial activity and Eugene's going to present this argument um, not just based on his research of uh, state practice and obviously judicial opinion but I hope he's also going to give us case examples of different European countries that are currently involved um, economically in countries that um, do fulfill the definition of international law of occupying territories so with that um, Eugene Kondorovich thank you thank you so much for us Thank you all for being here this morning. The topic is a topic that's about international law. It's not about Israel. It's about a general question of international law. One that has been raised very often in the context of Israel. And one that is one of the motivating arguments behind the BDS movement, behind both efforts on campus to impose uh, economic measures against Israel. Uh, and uh, most significant efforts in Europe and increasingly in the United States to persuade, coerce, or intimidate companies into not doing business with territories that would be described as occupied territories. Uh, as it happens in Europe and much of the rest of the world, it, they think Israel fits that description. Uh, and one of the arguments that's used very uh, aggressively uh, by a variety of NGOs and uh, so-called human rights groups is that international law prohibits interacting economically with such territories, not even occupied territories, territories with any kind of not fully kosher regime, right, whatever that means, a potentially broader definition than occupied. So, so for example, recently these efforts have actually gained traction in the official workings and official policies of the European Union. So two years ago, the, a year and a half ago, the European Union adopted a set of guidelines, the guidelines for funding projects to Israel, to provide that whenever Europe and Israel have some kind of co collaboration or an Israeli institution gets a European grant, it has to be certified that not a single euro of those grants will be spent across the green line. So this, and why do they say this? That's because international law requires this. International law restricts, prohibits third party countries from this kind of activity. Another example of the kind of European policy which has been motivated by these kind of claims is a round of legal advisories that have been issued by European foreign and trade ministries of many but not all European countries. It is likely, and the efforts are for the European Union itself, the European Commission, to issue such warnings. And the warnings say, warning about doing business in the West Bank, Golan Heights, or Gaza. The latter is an interesting inclusion. Um, and they said, it is, there are legal risks, legal risks to doing business that support Israeli settlements or the Israeli occupation of these places. Now, they don't tell you exactly what the legal risks are, but they advise CEOs and general counsels to whom such guidance is addressed to go, you know, seek legal advice and ask a lawyer. Uh, and I'm a lawyer, and my goal here is to provide that legal advice about the scale 
and scope of those risks. So it turns out there's a good reason the European uh, advisors say that there are illegal risks rather than it is illegal or you would violate X, Y, or Z rule. The reason is uh, those ri there are risks, of course, uh, but those risks are very close to zero because there does not seem to be any prohibition uh, against such kind of economic interactions. And we can learn this by studying examples where this issue has been explicitly addressed, where this issue has been explicitly addressed. Because it turns out that this is not a case of first impression. None of these issues, what about the labeling of products from Israeli communities uh, across the Green Line, all of these issues have been addressed elsewhere. And knowing this, I think, is extremely important, knowing uh, before, before I proceed, it's extremely important to be able to deal with efforts to intimidate companies in particular, uh, college students, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if it's effective with them, uh, but this is something every general counsel and everyone who talks to companies about these kind of issues needs to know, uh, because they're told they're illegal risks, that sounds scary, but that can actually be un 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 unpacked into uh, what seems a, a, re a relatively safe proposition. So uh, take, uh, take Western Sahara, for example, as Morocco did in 1974. Uh, Western Sahara has been under Moroccan occupation since then. At the same time, it has an, Morocco has an extensive set of relationships with the European Union. It's the biggest trade partner, biggest foreign aid partner, because of course Morocco immediately is immediately adjacent to Europe and they have very extensive relationships. Morocco, when it receives its foreign aid from Europe, which is a great deal of aid, its grants, Europe imposes no restrictions on those grants going to Western Sahara. So there's no analog to the settlement guidelines for Western Sahara. Morocco gets all this foreign aid, it can spend it unrestricted. Unrestricted. Is it likely that it would wind up in Western Sahara? It certainly seems likely because Western Sahara in Morocco is not a separate legal entity. It doesn't have a separate governance. It's not under military law. It's been annexed and incorporated as two southern provinces of Morocco, and thus it's likely that aid would, would get there. So if, requir if there's a requirement to prohibit such aid, uh, then, then this policy is, is an oversight. But maybe that's just what it is. Maybe it's just an oversight. Maybe they forgot to apply the settlement guidelines to Western Sahara. But then the issue actually came to the fore in a very explicit way. This, so far, we're talking about indirect aid. Right? That is to say, they give it to Morocco. Morocco spends it in Western Sahara, the analog of the settlement guidelines. But it turns out it goes much further. It turns out Europe has an explicit program, which has been expanding in recent years, to provide direct aid to Morocco's presence in Western Sahara. Direct aid. Now, how does that work? So, Morocco, Western Sahara is rich in natural resources, is poor in everything else. Uh, and the Europeans wanted to get at some of those resources, in particular the fisheries. And they had several treaties with the uh, Moroccans about fisheries. And the Moroccans insisted that the scope, the geographic scope of these treaties, include Western Sahara or territories under Moroccan <coughs> jurisdiction, as they're described. Now, Europe, and as a matter of fact, no country in the world, does not recognize Western Sahara as Moroccan territory. But nonetheless, they agreed in the treaty to extend the scope of the treaty to what Moroccan-controlled Western Sahara and actually pay Morocco for access to Western Saharan natural resources. Now, some people had questions about this. And this was going on, by the way, at the exact same time the settlement guidelines were being imposed. Some people in the European Parliament did not think this was good. They said, this violates international law. Didn't you hear just the other day? Uh, we said there's an international law that prohibits aid to such occupied territories. Uh, and the Europeans asked the Moroccans, maybe, you know, look, it's caused a bit of controversy. Maybe you'll agree to take this out. The Moroccans said, absolutely not. And the Europeans said, well, maybe then we won't have a deal. The Moroccans said, that's okay. Uh, and indeed, the treaty lapsed, right, did not go into effect. Uh, there was a year in which they didn't have any fisheries arrangement. Then the Europeans thought, they said, okay, we, we need to work this out. And they asked their legal advisor. The European Parliament has a legal advisor. They said, if there's a legal question, let's find out the answer. And they asked him a, a, a question. Actually, they asked him twice, two different times. He wrote two very similar memos. Is, is there any prohibition in international law? 
from engaging in this kind of activity. And he said, yeah, took 20 pages to say it, uh, he said international law does not prohibit this kind of activity. Uh, even though, even on the assumption that, that Morocco has no um, sovereignty uh, and no legitimacy in Western Sahara. Now, the amazing thing is that was actually not a surprising answer, and they didn't take much of a risk by asking this legal advisor. That's actually, as far as things go in this field, fairly much black letter law. Because this wasn't a case of first impression, which makes the whole business even more puzzling. In 2002, Morocco uh, began extending oil exploration contracts to Western companies for Western Sahara. So when Morocco first took Western Sahara, they were there for the phosphates. Then they found some evidence of oil. They wanted to extract the oil. And uh, some human rights groups, I don't know actually how this exactly came before the Security Council, some people made a fuss and said, Morocco can't do this. It violates international law. Uh, it's illegal because this isn't really Morocco's territory, according to the world. So somehow, this, the Security Council posed this question to their legal advisor. It seems everybody has a legal advisor. There's a guy who's called the Deputy Secretary General for Law. His name was Hans Karel. He uh, was a Swedish or Norwegian guy, I believe. And he wrote an opinion on this. And he studied all the state practice. And he said, I, I want to report on all the state practice supporting such a rule. But it's a very short report, because there's, there is no state practice supporting such a prohibition. And there's no evidence of the existence of such a prohibition. He said, the only thing that maybe there is is since the occupied people, the, uh, the, the, the indigenous people, they might have some kind of ownership, quasi-ownership rights over natural resources. So an extraction of natural resources has to pay them some money or uh, confer some benefit to them. You have to share the spoils with them in a usufructory way. That means you can take the thing, but you can't deplete the whole thing, and you have to share, share some of the proceeds. And this is how finally he drew the line, and it seems to establish a very clear rule. So what about the oil exploration contracts? Are they legal or illegal under that standard? They're legal, he says, because they're not extractive. They're just oil exploration contracts. So that's, that's not extraction. That's just doing business. And for doing business, even doing business that is antecedent and premised on, extract, on, on extraction, uh, he said, there's no restriction. It was a very short memo. Um, the European advisor took 20 pages to say the same thing. Uh, so that's a, that's, that's, a very that's a very important decision, uh, which goes entirely undiscussed uh, in other contexts. So it's no surprise. Now, the Europeans went further, and they actually entered into contracts with Morocco for extractive industries, uh, fish, namely. Uh, but the legal advisor said, that's OK, too. We'll pay the, 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 the Moroccans said that they'll pay some money to the local Sahari people. That's OK. So there does not seem to be any prohibition in this context. Indeed, many European companies, American and Canadian and Australian companies also, are very active in Western Sahara. Total, one of the biggest French industrial concerns, uh, is one of the main economic players in Western Sahara. Now, the Western Saharan people, the Sahari, are not generally happy about this. Uh, and their kind of version of the uh, PLO, the Polisario, makes a big stink. And uh, everyone tells them, saying, quoting the arguments of the Palestinians, actually. And uh, everyone tells them that they're wrong. Uh, and they, uh, they have not gotten far with this. So that's Western Sahara. Now, it's not just uh, fish in Western Sahara. There's another issue that has really arisen. So this was something that was actually debated. Right? Earlier, I suggested that maybe they didn't notice that they were subsidizing uh, Morocco and Western Sahara, but now they noticed, at least as of 2011, when this thing became a big, a big fuss. What about uh, tomatoes? So it turns out that uh, they grow some tomatoes somehow in, in Western Sahara, and they're imported to Europe. And they're labeled made in Morocco, because they're imported by Moroccan firms. Now. Uh, some member of the European Parliament asked a question in the European Parliament of uh, one of the European officials. How can we say it's made in Morocco if it's made in Western Sahara, which we don't recognize <coughs> as Morocco? And they gave the following answer. It's actually a very good answer. It's the, it's the true answer. So what you have to understand, 
We're not saying it's made in Morocco. They're saying it's made in Morocco, right? The people who print the label. We are just allowing them to import it. And under our rules governing imports, under our various agreements, there is no basis to exclude a product for its labeling unless it's going to be deceptive to the consumer. And we don't think the consumer either cares or will be deceived. We don't think this is any kind of real fraud. This doesn't rise to the level of fraud. This is just a, this is like a political thing. And this is what country do you think it's part of, but that's not real fraud. And thus, there is no basis under European regulation to govern, does it say, made in here or made in there. Uh, and there's very good reasons that that's the European rule. Obviously, they don't want uh, the Argentinians suing every time Falkland wool is labeled made in the UK, which is actually a very disputed proposition amongst the nations of the world. So it's good. that's the European rule. And I said consumer deception is the only basis. The fact that it's not really in Morocco, that's, not a, that's, that's for the politicians, not for the trade labeling people. OK, so Morocco uh, seems to be uh, a case that turns out differently. It took a case that turns out differently. And now let me tell you the story. Um, this isn't, I haven't written about this. Uh, let me tell you the story about how I ended the occupation of Western Sahara, single-handedly almost. And uh, it's a fun story. And you too can end occupations if you want, once you learn the very simple trick. Um, so based on my papers on this subject, uh, which have been read by uh, some members of the European Parliament, I keep referring that there's a lot of members of the European Parliament, so they have lots of opportunities to do things and ask questions. So some of them had read my uh, papers, and they, uh, there's like a kind of prime minister's question hour type thing in the European Parliament, where the different European officials, in this case it was Catherine Ashton, the head of the External, uh, External Action Service, they come and they get asked questions and they blow off the parliamentarians, and that's how it goes. So in this session, one of the European parliamentarians said, how come we have this fisheries treaty with Morocco and have the tomatoes and all that stuff when we say that we can't spend any money in occupied territory, we just passed the guidelines saying that. So that seems there's a contradiction. Can you please resolve it? And the response of the External Action Service was, it's a good question, we'll get back to you. Let's figure out what the answer is and uh, we'll get back to you. So then they went and started trying to think what the answer is. Uh, and they came back and they came up with two distinctions. They said, well, Western Sahara is actually different. Yes, it's true, our treatment is different. It's true that the rules we say apply here, we do not actually apply in Western Sahara, and vice versa. But it turns out they're different cases. So first of all, the UN says the West Bank is occupied. Which is true, the UN does say the West Bank is occupied. But the UN also says that Western Sahara is occupied. So it's not much. I'm not clear if they knew that or didn't know. It's a very publicly knowable fact. They may actually have known it and were really trying to blow off the parliamentarian, because the statement actually says, well, there are lots of differences. The UN says the West Bank is occupied. They don't say, but does not say, Morocco, right? they imply. But uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be a distinction. But maybe I think that they might have been purposefully obfuscatory, accidentally. The resolution, there are several resolutions, a couple resolutions uh, from the General Assembly declaring Western Sahara uh, as occupied territory. OK, so that's not a, a different. And then they say, but also, it's just that Western Sahara just isn't occupied. It just isn't occupied. Now, what about the Moroccan army there? Uh, what about the, uh, all the countries of the world that consider it occupied, including probably most European countries? Uh, they, they don't speak of it often, but uh, that does seem to be their formal position to the extent it can be ascertained. They say, well, that, okay, that's, it's like occupation, but it's not actually occupation. Because unlike the West Bank, Western Sahara, what country was that when Morocco took it over? There was no country. Right? It was a kind of a hanging Spanish colony. And then the Spanish left, and then it wasn't a Spanish colony, but it wasn't a country. And it became a scene of a kind of three-way war for its control amongst local countries surrounding. Sound familiar? But then, so it wasn't a country. It was just this abandoned by its previous colonial caretaker, orphaned, and then warred amongst by the uh, neighboring states. And Morocco happened to win that war uh, between Morocco, Mauritania, and Algeria. So they said, so so that, it's not like it's not like that. Okay, I'm not sure I understand that distinction fully, but. 
I think it's extremely important and needs to be vastly publicized that the uh, lawyers of the External Action Service of the European Commission are on record stating the position that if a territory was not previously a sovereign state, it falling under the military control of a foreign power does not constitute belligerent occupation within the meaning of the Geneva Convention. Now, by the way, it doesn't matter whether it's actually occupied. Right? If, it's, if it's some other status, non-self-governing territory is what they called it, there's no reason to think that the rules applicable to what an uh, administrator of a non-self-governing territory can do that's uh, different from uh, the rules of what an occupier can do. And indeed, the legal theory, the kind of name for the idea behind you can't do business with these kind of territories, non-recognition, uh, the only real, it, it's moment in the sun, its principal moment of articulation and application was an advisory opinion uh, by the ICJ uh, in the Namibia case about the control of Southwest Africa uh, by South Africa. But of course, they, they called it an occupation occasionally, informally. But of course, South Africa wasn't an occupier of Namibia. They were the mandatory trustee. Under the, uh, under the League of Nations mandate. So the, the differences in the basis of the legal presence uh, does not seem to matter. The rule of non-recognition as formulated by the ICJ in Namibia, at least, seems to be a rule against what one could broadly call improper or illegal territorial regimes. Right? Because the, the complaint against South Africa wasn't that it invaded and occupied Namibia. It was that it had somehow overstayed its, uh, its welcome. As a, as a mandatory. Okay, so those are the distinctions that they drew. Uh, one of them doesn't make sense. The other is certainly intriguing. Um, so that's the case of Western Sahara. Then there's the case of uh, Northern Cyprus, which is a really interesting case. So Western Sahara is a great case because you know Morocco is right next to, to um, Europe. You can walk from Morocco to the European Union. But Cyprus, of course, is in the European Union. So uh, this is an interesting situation to keep in mind. Lately, there's a talking point that European officials have um, been using. That, you know, it's true we talk a lot about Israel compared to other things. But you have to understand, it's very close to us. European ambassador to uh, Israel has recently said this. It's making the rounds, I think. It's very close to us. It's kind of close. Not as close as Morocco, by the way. Uh, but Cyprus is so close, it's actually in Europe. And it has been occupied by uh, Turkey, in part. About one third of the uh, Republic of Cyprus has been occupied uh, by Turkey since also 1974. 1974-75 was a great year for invasions and occupations, <laughs> by the way. Um, and Europe. You know, this is not a simple situation for Europe because they don't recognize Turkish control in this area, and nor can they easily. So, for example, some things here they do apply. The rules here are a bit tougher that they apply. In oh, by the way, uh, also the United States. Just so you know, um, just as of last year, the United States in the most recent spending bill, final note on Morocco. Uh, Morocco has amazing lobbyists, you should know. I think they're much better than APAC. They are very, very good. Uh, and they succeeded in getting um, a provision in the foreign aid bill under the heading Morocco, in all sorts of things that Morocco is going to get to fight terrorists, etc. And then subsection, Western Sahara. Money given to Morocco, it can spend in Western Sahara. Uh, so that didn't really generate much controversy, but the lobbyists really sought it. Uh, and that's an extremely interesting uh, precedent to, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, I don't know why other countries don't seek similar legislation. So America also seems to think there is no uh, legal prohibition from spending money or giving money to uh, uh, power for use in territory, not its own. OK, so Europe has to be stricter with Turkey but because Cyprus is a member. Indeed, it is a little stricter. So it doesn't allow the importation of uh, goods from northern Cyprus labeled Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. But that's OK, because they don't make many goods in northern Cyprus. Uh, the principal businesses in northern Cyprus, 
which are partly a restriction, or a result of the restrictions on imports. Um, but so there's no restrictions on Turkey. Yeah, let's start with the top. No restrictions on Turkey. So Turkish companies that are bu busy in northern Cyprus, Turkish banks, etc., have no restrictions in their dealing with Europe. That's important because the entire economy of northern Cyprus is based on Turkish mainland concerns who are active there. Um, the, the two biggest industries in, Western, in uh, northern Cyprus are tourism uh, and kind of, a, what do you call it? Permanent vacation tourism? I don't know what it's called. Retirement? This thing that the British do when they go to Spain. So the, uh, and buy houses there and retire. So that's the, Northern Cyprus is, in the, Cyprus is a competitor in that market with Spain, as is Northern Cyprus. And the other big business is education. So you remember REL University? Yes. So there was a lot of indignation in Europe. The New York Times wrote about it. This is quite a thing Israel is doing, establishing a university in occupied territory. Because, you know, that's, that's bad. Uh, now, I always thought the thing strange because the differences between a college and a university are purely internal Israeli bureaucratic designations. In, you know, in America, anyone can call themselves a university. So the Turks have established a university in northern Cyprus. As a matter of fact, they've established about 10 or 12, depending on how you count. Uh, some of them are, most of them are public. Some of them are branches of very major uh, mainland universities in Ankara and Istanbul. And those universities, they didn't establish 12 universities for the uh, residents of Northern Cyprus. They're geared to the foreign market, foreign students. They teach in English. It's on the beach, kind of like you know, med school in, in, in Dominica or something. So th this, is, this is a very big business. They've invested a lot of money in it. It's a successful business. That's why they've done it so many times. Um, So these universities have very extensive relationships with European schools. Some of them are actually members of Erasmus, the European Academic Exchange Program, which Ariel University is excluded from. Uh, and they have joint degree study abroad programs with British universities, including, ironically, some of the same British universities that signed letters of protest about uh, the designation of Ariel as a university. Uh, and the real estate market is very heavily geared towards Europeans and, in particular, Brits. And if you want to see settlement construction, go to northern Cyprus. There's huge villas going up all over the place. They have a, a kind of a international flags flying around them to show that they welcome people of, uh, of all stripes. And it's being marketed directly to, to Britain. Now, what's Britain say about this? They did issue a guidance. They said, if you're buying a house in occupied Cypriot territory, please make sure that it actually belongs to the people who are selling it. <laughs> now, there were some problems, right? So first, when they started inviting the Brits, they were just selling them the houses of the Greeks who fled. And there were some several cases in the European Court of Human Rights about this. And the um, Greek claimants prevailed. And this became a legal headache for property buyers of abandoned Greek properties. But there's a lot of room in northern Cyprus, so eventually the, the Turks got a better idea. That, and you, know, you can't be selling these 1974 you know, bullet-ridden houses forever. So, so now they're in the base, they're making new subdivisions. Massive, gorgeous ones. Um, and uh, you can look, I have a blog post on the Volokh conspiracy from uh, maybe five months ago where I put up some pictures of this illegal settlement construction. Uh, unfortunately, it's very poorly documented. Neither Amnesty nor Human Rights Watch have engaged in any fact-finding or documentation against this, but I sent a, a student of mine uh, to Northern Cyprus, and uh, it's, it's really quite amazing. They look, you know, they're big. They're very nice. Uh, so none of that is in any way restricted by Europe. But it gets better. So you, Europe knows. I mean, this is a real, there's like real estate agents who specialize in selling Cypriot prop Northern Cypriot properties to, um, to Brits. The European Commission actually has a funding program to support the Turks in northern Cyprus. So it's called, the Europe, it's a very long name, the European Aid Program for the Turkish Cypriot Community. Now all the, all the Turks now are in the north, that's important to know. 
Uh, they used to also be elsewhere, but now they're all in the north. So the Turkish uh, Cypriot community is all in Turkish occupied <coughs> northern Cyprus. And what's this aid program do? It does like a whole bunch of things. It you know does water works, like improves water pipage and sewage, uh, holds concerts for cultural purposes, helps small businesses uh, cater to uh, improve their ability to reach out to tourists and attract tourism, because that's one of the big, the big businesses. Nowhere in the uh, activities, I've read all of their statements and audits and reports, nowhere do they once mention a single legal problem with this kind of activity. Now, if you ask the Europeans, they'll say, well, look, that's different. That's different. It's true we do this, but that's different. And they, there's uh, two distinctions they would draw. They would say, well, you know, Cyprus is actually part of the European Union, and this is part of Cyprus. So we can do whatever we want. So that, that's a very strange argument, because if these, if these restrictions come from the Geneva Conventions or some kind of high-level international law, it's very hard to understand why the fact that one of the, if a member of your treaty organization falls under occupation, you have greater rights than, uh, than anybody else would. Now, the other argument they give, they don't, they, I, think that, I think they're not going to use this argument much in the future. The other argument they give is they say, well, look, we're not really, you know, they, they say, look, we have, we have a conundrum. Some of these people on the island are European citizens. Because right? people born in the Republic of Cyprus are European citizens. So some of these Turks are European citizens. They're Cypriot citizens, thus European citizens. So it would be discriminatory if we didn't have like any aid programs that helped them, because we help other people in Europe. So we have to be able to help them too. Okay, that's that's a not implausible argument. The problem is you usually, usually in law in questions like this, you know, we go by the majority and the minority of people now in Cyprus, northern Cyprus, are not Turkish settlers. So Turkish settlers are now exclusively the majority. And this reasoning would be a bit more credible if any of the funding instruments required European citizenship as a condition for getting money, which they don't. And which many other European funding projects, where they care if you're a European citizen or not, do require. That's like not a legal, it's not a legal requirement unknown to European uh, commission lawyers. Indeed, many of the areas targeted, the less developed areas, are the areas in which the Turkish settlers uh, predominate. And there's no attempt to exclude them uh, whatsoever. Certainly, for example, in their guidelines for Israel, they make no exclusion for, say, French citizens uh, living uh, in Gila. Uh, there's, no, there's no such notion that they need to be able to get aid via, via Israel. Okay. So they have, the, they have these direct programs. Now, the American State Department uh, has an Office of Foreign Trade Promotion, and they actually think it's so legal to do business in Northern Cyprus that they actually have a little pamphlet advising American companies how to do it. You know, what are better industries, who to call, how to set things up, <coughs> what to be afraid of, just like they do for any other place. They have one for Cyprus, they have one for Northern Cyprus. Um, they say, you know, there's not so much industry, stay away from industry, tourism is good, retail's okay. Uh, and indeed, there are many European and American businesses that have a direct retail presence on the island. Uh, for example, uh, HSBC, uh, Johnny Rockets, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Domino's recently just opened up, according to the uh, US Foreign and Commercial Service, they just opened a branch. Uh, so these companies have not been subject to any boycotts, threats, or anything by virtue of their activity in this occupied territory, which is, um, which is worth noting. Which is worth noting. So uh, it would seem that if Domino's were to choose to open up uh, a branch in the old city, this would be something worth mentioning to them, uh, that you've already decided it's OK by virtue of your presence in, across, the, across the other green line. The line that divides the island uh, through Nicosia is also called the, the Green Line. Um, okay, now one way in which one way in which the treatment of Cyprus is similar uh, to the treatment of Israel is the is the rules of origin issue. So these products can't be labeled made in Turkish Republic of Northern of Northern Cyprus. Now that is not because they don't think it comes from the Turkish. Republic of Northern Cyprus. There was a case about this in the European Court of Justice. 
And the European Court of Justice said, look, because we have a separate trade agreement, not uh, with the Republic of Cyprus, you can only have one trade agreement for a given area. And you can't have two different customs entities in the same place. Okay. So again, that suggests that it's not required by general international law. Right? Countries that don't have the same trade agreements would not have the same rules, and so forth. Okay. <coughs> now, there are several other occupations worth speaking about. I don't want to take too long. Uh, really, the past few, the past decade has been a rich time for my area of study. Uh, and in particular, there, are, there is an occupation by Armenia of uh, parts of Azerbaijan. And there are several occupations by Russia, first of parts of Georgia, and now more recently uh, of parts of Ukraine. Now again, by the, to, to, to revert to what Brooke said at the beginning, uh, I don't want to say for sure that any of these situations is an occupation. I was like, my threshold for the, my selection criteria, the inclusion criteria is, it has to be colorably an occupation. Now, we don't really know much about what is and is not an occupation. Right? That is to say, if Israel's presence in Gaza, where they have no troops, can be an occupation, my list may be very under-inclusive. Right? There may be many other situations that might be occupations. Israel might be occupied by Hamas, by virtue of the tunnels and rockets. Uh, Lesotho might be occupied by South Africa, by, by the entry, entry rules. These are all things cited to explain why Gaza is occupied. So these are things that are colorably occupied. Mm. Take, for example, Eastern Ukraine, as, as Putin just did this week. Uh, so, <laughs> as far as I know, there are no countries in the world, other than maybe Ukraine and Poland, that consider Eastern Ukraine occupied by Russia. Why is that? I mean, there are Russian tanks and soldiers and special forces there. Okay, but they're, they're not really running the show. They're just pulling the strings. And the occupation means you've displaced the local government and are now the government. <coughs> Who is the local government? The People's Commission of Donetsk. That's not Russia. I, it's controlled by Russia. Okay, there's a difference. For occupation, it's your forces need to be in control. Now, this is surprising, right? given the fact that Israel is occupying Gaza, and it's not even their guys who are running the show, but their enemies who are running the show. But nonetheless, this is actually not a bad statement of the law of occupation. So it's actually a question. Um, there's a very interesting, if you want if you want to know what occupation is, there's a very interesting report by the, someone who I think was sent by the OSCE, a European bureaucrat. Uh, he wrote this report so that you couldn't read it. It's in about four parts with three annexes, each of which is a couple hundred pages. But one of its agendas is to explain why South Ossetia is occupied by Russia, whereas Abkhazia is not, in this view. And the reason is the, 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 the form by which Russia controls Abkhazia is somewhat looser than the form that uh, it controls uh, South Ossetia. So anyway, so this, and he may be right. I don't know, it's a very long, dis very long discussion uh, of the minute of Russian control. Now, in any case, there are no restrictions on Armenia or Russia by virtue of their presence in these territories. And most notably, Russia enjoyed the Olympics recently, which was held right next to occupied Georgian territory. And indeed, uh, one of the things they did that I thought of it was, was cute, uh, they, most of the workers for the Olympics, because it takes lots of building, um, were housed in Sumy, the, uh, the Abkhaz city near uh, Sochi, not to be confused with Sochi. Uh, so they, there was a lot of settlement construction there for the purpose of the Olympics. That went by uh, unremarked. Now, the problem is you can't learn too much from Abkhazia and Nagorno-Karabakh, etc., because there's just very little economic activity there in the first place. But it does seem that uh, Armenia does engage in some extraction in Nagorno-Karabakh, gold and copper, if I remember correctly. Uh, for export, uh, and those, those are, it's exported by the standard Armenian gold and copper exporting firms. It's a big business in Armenia, as far as big business goes in Armenia. Uh, and those firms operate under no, uh, under no uh, restriction. Now, so state practice clearly supports a permissive rule. Clearly supports a permissive rule. By the way, it's very strange that we have to go to state practice 
it occurred to me very late in working on this. Why not just read what the, does the Geneva Convention have any actual restrictions? If you read the Geneva Convention, maybe even the Geneva Convention itself says that suggests that um, occupation uh, authorities can have, engage in business in the occupied territory, because the Geneva Convention does have certain rules specifically prohibiting certain kinds of economic practices. What kind of economic practices does it prohibit? Restrictive ones. So it prohibits the occupying power from shutting down local businesses, from boycotting economic businesses, from giving monopolies to its own businesses, but authorizes them to do business with local businesses, which suggests it's OK. Um, now, it's also worthy to note there are two recent court decisions, specifically on this subject, in France and Europe, uh, in which uh, different BDS groups tried to sue various European companies who did some business in, across the Green Line. Uh, Achava, the Dead Sea Works people, and uh, Viola, a European company which participated in, uh, in the building of the, of the light rail. And in both cases, the court said, look, you're saying that the Geneva Convention prohibits transferring people into occupied territory. These people didn't transfer anyone. They're just doing business. I, but maybe other people have been transferred and there are settlements there. And this might help somehow the settlements. Uh, so the UK Supreme Court, which addressed that specific question, doesn't it kind of help the settlements? I said, it's a very far-fetched story. Are these people who live in this remote settlement by the Dead Sea, would they really not live there <coughs> if they had to commute to work in Jerusalem? Maybe someone else would live there. So you'd have, you know, by legal standards, to show that people came to live somewhere because of the Dead Sea works, very hard to do. Uh, it's a problem where they went for other reasons, ideological, etc. So you can't really show that this has any relation to any, uh, any, any prohibition. Um, so that's a very strong decision by the um, UK Supreme Court, uh, and one also wor worth, worth publicizing. Uh, just so you know, the response to that is, well, that's just the UK Supreme Court. What about the ICJ's advisory opinion in Namibia? And I think the complete answer to that is a binding opinion in a contentious case, a criminal case, actually, by the UK Supreme Court sounds a lot better than a non-binding old opinion from the uh, ICJ, an advisory, uh, an advisory opinion. And even if the ICJ may have been right in 1970 whenever they wrote this, uh, the proposition that they may be floated as a suggestion of a duty of non-recognition has been completely rejected by states uh, in their uniform practice. Uh, and indeed, uh, the, the UK decision is much more consistent with state practice and has the advantage of being an actual decision. Uh, I mean, more and more, you, know, you, can, you can say a lot more on this. Where would interna you know, international law would actually barely exist if it were not for the decisions of British high courts, which were the principal mode of exposition of international law in the 19th century. So it's worth a great deal. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Yeah. Can you, you've indicated, you know, sketched the areas where the principle of occupation, including trade, has not been applied. Putting aside the West Bank, is there any other place where it has been? Oh, can you just repeat the question, please? Yeah. Is there any other case that has been subject to these rules? That, that's the West Bank. So the rules of origin issue, there is another example, which is Northern Cyprus. So the European treatment of the rules of origin issue is, uh, is similar. But again, that does not seem to be because of any rule of international law requiring that, but because of the particularities of European trade agreements, both with Israel uh, uh, and with the Republic of uh, Cyprus. Um, again, I'm focusing on the Europeans just because they're a big trade player. There is other relevant state practice. For example, America also has a direct appropriation to an Armenian presence in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, and the Turks at one point actually, first they tried to get rid of it, then they said, well, you have to give some of it to, not the Turks, pardon, the, uh, the uh, Azeris. Uh, you have to give some, you have to share it with the Azeris, and that hasn't happened. Um, <clears throat> the, 
there were many, so it's hard to tell, right? It's hard to tell in a sense because you don't know what would have happened otherwise. There are people who say that there were countries who refrained from engaging in business in East Timor because of the Indonesian occupation. Uh, so countries rejected Indonesia's presence and they said uh, it's not cool. And then you can say, you know, and then when you look at it, there wasn't much foreign business there. Now, I'm not sure that it's a causal relationship. First of all, there was never much foreign business there. There's really nothing to do there. And the only thing to do there, which is oil extraction, uh, they immediately signed a large, important, and controversial treaty with Australia, the Timor Gap Treaty, which is still the subject of litigation because Timor Leste says it was illegal for Australia to, uh, to sign it. Uh, and Australia uh, said, you know, it's true that the world thinks it's occupied, but why should that stop us from getting the oil? And that's a significant counterexample, which probably economically, um, yeah, oh, okay, I'm beginning to recall. There was, there was some detail that the International Cocoa Board, Coffee Board, which is a consortium of coffee growers, wouldn't certify as Indonesian coffee from East Timor. But this was economically very marginal. East Timorese coffee production was very primitive uh, and accounted for a very small, uh, small, small part of the GDP, which was itself very small. Uh, on the other hand, this oil business was very big. It actually went to the ICJ. Uh, East Timor, as soon as it became a country, sued Australia, saying, it's illegal, because this was our oil. And we were occupied by, um, we were occupied by, uh, by Indonesia. And the International Court of Justice said, uh, we cannot decide this case because Australia does not agree to jurisdiction. So we have nothing more we can say. Yeah. Of these children and the indoctrination towards violence that donor nations of the UN are funded. And yet, not once have BDS advocates advocated that we should be boycotting the United Nations or we should be boycotting any of the donor nations to UNRWA. And I want to talk just a little bit about general human rights violations in the West Bank. The Palestinian Authority routinely carries out death sentences against Palestinian civilians. When I was in Nablus, we witnessed gallows where they hang people. There was no form of due process. Death sentences are also carry, are, are carried out by the PLO, so-called military courts, as well as civil courts. And one of two of the mandatory, uh, uh, two of the offenses, the minor offenses for which the death penalty is mandatory include selling land to a Jew and the charge of collaborating with the Israelis. Collaborating basically being a catch-all term if you're caught doing anything that the Palestinian Authority or Hamas doesn't want you to do, you get put to death. Besides not being afforded a, a right to a fair trial, in the overcrowded Daria prison near Hebron, the Palestinian Authority controlled prison. The Palestinian Authority packs four inmates, minimum four inmates, into cells designated for one. Twelve cases of torture were reported only over the last few months. The Palestinian Authority also ignores rulings by the Palestinian courts themselves who order the release of political dissidents. So I don't think, again, I have to tell you that these practices are obviously in direct violation of international law, specifically Articles 9 and 6 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which, which mandate that every person is entitled to due process and a fair trial and the death penalty only be, only be implemented for the most egregious crimes. And yet, obviously, the BDF movement has never once condemned these practices by the Palestinian Authority, not once. Now, I could go on about what's happening in Hamas, but because of time, what I'd like to do is I would like to go four or five pages uh, and, and talk about the charge, the BDS charge that Israel is a racist and apartheid state. The BDS movement charges this all the time while remaining completely silent on the mass scale sexual, ethnic, and religious segregation and violence that occurs in every single Islamist state in the Middle East against Christians and Jews, as well as moderate Muslim men and women, and especially against Palestinians. So let me be clear, all Arab governments have segregation laws against Palestinians. In Syria and Lebanon, Palestinians are kept in ghettos under brutal conditions. 
There are at least 12 such ghettos that we know of in Lebanon that house just under half a million Palestinians in which they are denied the right to education and health care. In Lebanon, Palestinians have no right to own property and they're not entitled to proper medical treatment. Lebanese parliament, parliament members have actually gone on record saying their official policy is to, quote, maintain Palestinians as vulnerable and in a precarious situation so as to diminish the prospects for naturalization or permanent settlement. Since 2011, Jordan has actually begun revoking citizenship from Palestinians or anyone of Palestinian descent. Egypt recently enacted a law that denies citizenship to anyone of mixed Palestinian origin, even if they were born to Egyptian parents. In modern day Libya and Kuwait and Iraq, Palestinians are not allowed to own homes and they're barred from holding 70 types of occupation. In 1991, within a single week, 400,000 Palestinians were expelled from Kuwait and other Gulf countries without a single UN resolution of protest and without a single call from the BDS movement to boycott Kuwait. The BDS movement does not call for the boycott of any of these states because it's not based on the, eth based on the ethical value of saving Palestinian lives, but it's based purely on hatred for Israel because it is a Jewish state. And because the BDS movement chooses to ignore the massive human rights violations occurring against Palestinian people because they don't have a strong man Israel to blame, what they are doing is they are sending a green light to these terrorist groups and states, go ahead, continue killing Palestinians with impunity, we will turn a blind eye, go ahead, we don't care. That is the message the BDS community is sending when it only focuses its virulent hatred on Israel. And this silence is deafening. Even Norman Finkelstein, a well-known anti-Zionist activist and no supporter of Israel, has denounced the BDS movement as, quote, a hypocritical and dishonest cult that tries to pose as, a human, as human rights activists, while in the reality the goal is to destroy Israel. Even Noam Chomsky, a prominent pro-Palestinian activist, and the 2011 Sydney Peace Prize recipient said, quote, the hypocrisy of the BDS movement targeting Israel rises to the high heavens. It is not a call from the Palestinian people. And we can talk after in the Q&A who is actually behind the BDS movement. It isn't supported by the Palestinian people. This is still Noam Chomsky. It is run by people who falsely claim to represent the Palestinian people. And it harms the whole movement aimed at ensuring the human rights of Palestinian people be protected. And just to conclude with this, so what are the actual consequences that the BDS movement is promoting on the Palestinian people? Well, there are 96,000 Palestinian people who are employed by Israeli companies that are operating east of the 40 armistice lines. And the number is only increasing because of Palestinian Authority corruption and the inability of the Palestinian Authority to maintain a healthy economy. Palestinian working for Israeli companies are paid a twice the salary of the average Palestinian person uh, who is not because Israel has better minimum, minimum wage laws. So one intended consequence of the boycott is to force factories in the West Bank who are entirely owned or partially owned or controlled by Jews to close down or relocate inside Israel despite the fact that they employ Palestinians. And since many Palestinian families are obviously dependent on this income, the BDS movement effectively encourages the loss of 94,000 Palestinian jobs. And what the BDS movement has done, they've actually put pressure on the Palestinian Authority that has now made it illegal to sell products made by Jews in the West Bank and has also made it illegal to work with Jews both punishable by death. The Palestinian Authority has therefore confiscated and destroyed five million dollars worth of Palestinian goods that were bought from Jewish companies. So the consequence of the boycott divestment movement is the theft of five million dollars worth of Palestinian property and by January 1st, 2015, which is the arbitrary deadline the Palestinian Authority has set, 96,000 Palestinians will face unemployment and poverty. And just, I think this is terrible, to implement, I want to mention the story, to implement the boycott and this happened just this past April. The Palestinian Authority actually pulled a garbage truck outside the home of Jihad Shaheen's grocery shop, which is in the West Bank. Palestinian men got out and trashed 1,700 pounds of watermelon that he bought from Jewish farmers to sell to local Palestinians just to send 
the message. So if you think or if anyone tells you that a boycott helps Palestinians, it doesn't. You have to think other ones. And I'll end with this. So you would think that an advocate for Palestinian human rights and for peace between Israel and the Palestinians, which is how they couch their language, um, would want a strong Palestinian state, would want a strong economy, would want strong economic ties and economic interdependence with their neighbor, which is basically essential for peace, which reduces the chances of war between the two people. They would want Arabs and Jews working together. They would want them forming friendships over the water cooler. Yet this is clearly not what the BDS proponents want. And to me, it's so obvious that this shows such a high level of disrespect for the Palestinian people, dictating from afar who they can and cannot trade with economically, and also forcing them to continue to, to rely on donations from foreign countries. And as, as was mentioned, I believe the Palestinian people are the number one recipients in the entire history of humanity of foreign aid, foreign aid more than three times the amount given to rebuild the entirety of Europe under the Marshall Plan um, after World War II has been given to the Palestinian Authority who has then siphoned it through corruption. So is it the intention of the BDS movement that the Palestinians continue to rely on foreign dollars, that continue to allow the Palestinian Authority to indoctrinate their children with total impunity? And the answer is yes. And I'll end there, because I do want to go into the law, but I think we should do it in Q&A. So we can talk a little bit about the New York State Anti-Discrimination Statute, how it's applicable, as well as the Federal Export Administration Act. But to me, it's really obvious that BDS efforts are not only hampering a Palestinian economy, but they're also based on a culture of impunity for the major human rights violators against the Palestinian people. I risk my life to expose these human rights violations. I cannot respect a movement that is so wrapped up in hatred for Israeli Jews that they just turn a blind eye to what's really going on on the ground. And I really don't think you should respect it either. Thank you.